Brought to you by wikivd.com. Lou Gehrig. Henry Lewis the Iron Horse. Gehrig was an American baseball first baseman who played his entire professional career in major league baseball for the New York Yankees from 1923 until 1939. Gehrig was renowned for his prowess as a hitter and for his durability, a trait that tragically and ironically earned him his nickname the Iron Horse. He was an All-Star seven consecutive times, a Triple Crown winner once an American League Most Valuable Player twice, and a member of six World Series champion teams. He had a career .340 batting average, .632 slugging average and a .447 on-base average. He hit 493 home runs and had 1,995 runs batted in. In 1939 he was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame, and was the first MLB player to have his uniform number retired by a team. A native of New York City and attendee of Columbia University Gehrig signed with the Yankees in 1923. He set several major league records during his career including the most career Grand Slams and most consecutive games played a record that stood for 56 years and was long considered unbreakable until surpassed by Cal Ripken Jr. in 1995. Gehrig's consecutive game streak ended on May 2, 1939, when he voluntarily took himself out of the lineup to stunned players and fans after his performance on the field was hampered by amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, an incurable neuromuscular disorder, and now commonly referred to in North America as Lou Gehrig's disease. The disease forced him to retire at age 36, and was the cause of his death two years later. The pathos of his farewell from baseball was capped off by his iconic 1939 luckiest man on the face of the earth speech. At Yankee Stadium, in 1969, the Baseball Writers Association voted Gehrig the greatest first baseman of all time, and he was the leading vote-getter on the Major League Baseball All-Century team chosen by fans in 1999. A monument in Gehrig's honor originally dedicated by the Yankees in 1941, currently resides in Monument Park at Yankee Stadium. The Lou Gehrig Memorial Award is given annually to the MLB player who best exhibits Gehrig's integrity and character. Early life Gehrig was born in 1903 at 309 East 94th Street in the Yorkville neighborhood of Manhattan. He weighed almost 14 pounds at birth. He was the second of four children of German immigrants, Christina Fock and Heinrich Gehrig. His father was a sheet metal worker, by trade who was frequently unemployed due to alcoholism and his mother a maid, was the main breadwinner and disciplinarian in the family. His two sisters died at an early age, from whooping cough and measles, a brother also died in infancy. From an early age, Gehrig helped his mother with work doing tasks such as folding laundry and picking up supplies. From the local stores, Gehrig spoke German during his childhood. In 1910 he lived with his parents, at 2266 Amsterdam Avenue in Washington Heights. In 1920, the family resided on 8th Avenue in Manhattan. His name was often anglicized to Henry Louis Gehrig and he was known as Lou so that he would not be confused with his identically named father, who was known as Henry. Gehrig first garnered national attention for his baseball ability while playing in a game at Cubs Park on June 26, 1920. His New York School of Commerce team was playing a team from Chicago's Lane Tech High School in front of a crowd of more than 10,000 spectators with his team leading 8-6 in the top of the ninth inning. Gehrig hit a grand slam completely out of the Major League Park which was an unheard of feat for a 17-year-old. 
Gehrig attended PS 132 in the Washington Heights section of Manhattan, then went to Commerce High School, graduating in 1921. He then studied at Columbia University for two years before leaving to pursue a career in professional baseball. Initially he went to Columbia on a football scholarship where he was preparing to pursue a degree in engineering. Before his first semester began New York Giants manager John McGraw advised him to play summer professional baseball under an assumed name Henry Lewis, despite the fact that it could jeopardize his collegiate sports eligibility. After he played a dozen games for the Hartford Senators in the Eastern League he was discovered and banned from collegiate sports his freshman year. In 1922 Gehrig returned to collegiate sports as a fullback for the Columbia Lions football program. Later in 1923, he played first base and pitched for the Columbia baseball team. At Columbia, he was a member of Phi Delta Theta fraternity. On April 18, 1923, the same day that Yankee Stadium opened for the first time, and Babe Ruth inaugurated the new stadium. With a home run against the Boston Red Sox, Columbia pitcher Gehrig struck out 17 Williams college batters to set a team record though Columbia lost the game. Only a handful of collegians were at Southfield that day, but more significant was the presence of Yankee scout Paul Krakel who had been trailing Gehrig. For some time, it was not Gehrig's pitching that particularly impressed him, rather, it was Gehrig's powerful left-handed hitting. During the time Krakel observed him, Gehrig had hit some of the longest home runs ever seen on various eastern campuses, including a 450-feet home run on April 28 at Columbia's Southfield which landed at 116th Street and Broadway. He signed a contract with the Yankees on April 30. He returned to minor league Hartford to play parts of two seasons 1923 and 1924 batting .344 and hitting 61 home runs in 193 games. It was the only time Gehrig had ever played any level of baseball, Sandlot High School Collegiate or Pro for a team based outside New York City. New York Yankees 1923-1939 Gehrig joined the New York Yankees midway through the 1923 season and made his major league debut as a pinch hitter at age 19 on June 15, 1923. In his first two seasons he saw limited playing time. Mostly as a pinch hitter, he played in only 23 games and was not on the Yankees' 1923 World Series roster. In 1925 he batted .295 with 20 home runs, and 68 runs batted in. The 23-year-old Yankee first baseman's breakout season came in 1926, when he batted .313 with 47 doubles and American League leading 20 triples, 16 home runs and 112 RBI. In the 1926 World Series against the St. Louis Cardinals Gehrig hit .348. With two doubles and four RBIs, the Cardinals won the series four games to three. 1927 In 1927 Gehrig put together one of the greatest seasons by any batter in history, hitting .373 with 218 hits, 101 singles, 52 doubles, 18 triples, 47 home runs and then record 175 runs batted in, and a .765 slugging percentage. His 117 extra base hits that season a second all-time to Babe Ruth's 119 extra base hits in 1921 and his 447 total bases a third all-time. After Babe Ruth's 457 total bases in 1921 and Rogers Hornsby's 450 in 1922, 
Gehrig's production helped the 1927 Yankees to a 110-44 record the Alpennant and a four-game sweep of the Pittsburgh Pirates in the World Series. Although the Al recognized his season by naming him league MVP, Gehrig's accomplishments were overshadowed by Babe Ruth's 60 home run season and the overall dominance of the 1927 Yankees, a team often cited as having the greatest lineup of all time, the famed murderer's row. Despite playing in the shadow of Ruth for two-thirds of his career, Gehrig was one of the highest-run producers in baseball history. He had 509 RBIs during a three-season stretch. Only two other players, Jimmy Fox with 507 and Hank Greenberg with 503, have surpassed 500 RBIs in any three seasons. Their totals were non-consecutive. Playing 14 complete seasons, Gehrig had 13 consecutive seasons with 100 or more RBIs. Gehrig had six seasons where he batted .350 or better, plus a seventh season at .349. He had seven seasons with 150 or more RBIs, 11 with over 100 walks, 8 with 200 or more hits, and 5 with more than 40 home runs. Gehrig led the American League in runs scored four times, home runs three times, and RBIs five times. His 184 RBIs in 1931 remain the American League record as of 2015 and rank second all-time to Hack Wilson's 191 in 1930. On the single-season RBI list Gehrig ranks second, fifth and sixth, with four additional seasons of over 150 RBIs. He also holds the baseball record for most seasons, with 400 total bases or more accomplishing this feat five times in his career. He batted fourth in the lineup behind Ruth making it counterproductive to opposing pitches to intentionally walk Ruth. During the ten seasons in which Gehrig and Ruth were teammates, and next to each other in the batting order and played a majority of the games, Gehrig had more home runs than Ruth only once in 1934 when he hit 49 to Ruth's 22. They tied, at 46 in 1931. Ruth had 424 home runs compared to Gehrig's 347. However Gehrig outpaced Ruth in RBI, 1436 to 1316. Gehrig had a .343 batting average compared to .338 for Ruth. 1932 In 1932 Gehrig became the first player in the 20th century to hit four home runs in a game, when he accomplished the feat on June 3 against the Philadelphia Athletics. He narrowly missed getting a fifth home run when Athletic center fielder Al Simmons made a leaping catch of another fly ball at the center field fence. After the game manager Joe McCarthy told him, Well, Lou, nobody can take today away from you. On the same day, however, John McGraw announced his retirement after 30 years of managing the New York Giants. McGraw, not Gehrig, got the main headlines in the sports sections the next day. 1933. On August 17, 1933, Gehrig played in his 1,308th consecutive game against the St. Louis Browns at Sportsman's Park, which broke the longest consecutive games played streak previously held by Everett Scott. Scott attended as a guest of the Browns in September 1933. Gehrig married Eleanor Twitchell, the daughter of Chicago Parks Commissioner Frank Twitchell. 1936 In a 1936 World Series cover story about Lou Gehrig and Carl Hubble, Time proclaimed Gehrig, the game's number one batsman who takes boyish pride in banging a baseball as far and running around the bases as quickly as possible. Also in 1936, 
At the urging of his wife Eleanor Gehrig agreed to hire Babe Ruth's agent who in turn persuaded him to audition for the role of Tarzan the Ape Man. After Johnny Weissmuller had vacated the iconic movie role, but Gehrig only got as far as posing for a widely distributed and embarrassing photo of himself in a leopard-spotted costume. When Tarzan creator Edgar Rice Burroughs spotted the outfit he telegrammed Gehrig I want to congratulate you on being a swell first baseman. 2130 consecutive games on June 1, 1925, Gehrig entered the game as a pinch hitter substituting for shortstop Paul P. Wee Wonninger. The next day, June 2, Yankee manager Miller Huggins started Gehrig in place of regular first baseman Wally Pip. Pip was in a slump as was the team so Huggins made several lineup changes to boost their performance replacing Pip Aaron Ward and Wally Shang. Fourteen years later, Gehrig had played 2,130 consecutive games. In a few instances Gehrig managed to keep the streak intact through pinch-hitting appearances and fortuitous timing, in others. The streak continued despite injuries. For example, in addition, X-rays taken late in his life disclosed that Gehrig had sustained several fractures. During his playing career, although he remained in the lineup despite those previously undisclosed injuries, on the other hand the streak was helped. When Yankees general manager Ed Barrow postponed a game as a rainout on a day when Gehrig was sick with the flu, even though it was not raining, Gehrig's record of 2,130 consecutive games endured for 56 years until Baltimore Orioles shortstop Kyle Ripken Jr. surpassed it on September 6, 1995. Ripken finished with 2,632 consecutive games. Illness Although his performance in the second half of the 1938 season was slightly better, than in the first half Gehrig reported physical changes at the midway point. At the end of that season he said I was tired mid-season. I don't know why, but I just couldn't get going again. Although his final 1938 statistics were above average, they were significantly down from his 1937 season in which he batted .351 and slugged .643. In the 1938 World Series he had four hits in 14 at-bats all singles. When the Yankees began a 1939 spring training in St. Petersburg, Florida, it was clear that Gehrig no longer possessed his once formidable power. Even his base running was affected and at one point he collapsed at Al Lang Field, then the Yankees' spring training park. By the end of spring training he had not hit a home run. Throughout his career Gehrig was considered an excellent base runner. But as the 1939 season got underway his coordination and speed had deteriorated significantly. By the end of April his statistics were the worst of his career with 1 RBI and a .143 batting average. Fans and the press openly speculated on Gehrig's abrupt decline. James Kahn, a reporter who wrote often about Gehrig, said in one article, he was indeed meeting the ball with only one strikeout in 28 at-bats. However Joe McCarthy found himself resisting pressure from Yankee management to switch Gehrig to a part-time role. Things came to a head when Gehrig struggled to make a routine put out. At first base, the pitcher Johnny Murphy had to wait for him to drag himself over to the bag so he could feel the throw. Murphy said nice play Lou. On April 30th, Gehrig went hitless against the Washington Senators. He had just played his 2130th consecutive Major League game. On May 2nd, the next game after a day off, Gehrig approached McCarthy before the game in Detroit against the Tigers and said, I'm benching myself Joe telling the Yankees skipper that he was doing so for the good of the team. 
McCarthy acquiesced putting Ellsworth Babe Dahlgren in at first base, and also said that whenever Gehrig wanted to play again the position was his. Gehrig, as Yankee captain himself took the line-up card out to the shocked umpires before the game, ending the 14-year streak. Before the game began the Briggs Stadium announcer told the fans, Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time Lou Gehrig's name will not appear on the Yankee lineup in 2,130 consecutive games. The Detroit Tigers fans gave Gehrig a standing ovation while he sat on the bench with tears in his eyes. A wire service photograph of Gehrig reclining against the dugout steps with a stoic expression appeared the next day in the nation's newspapers. He stayed with the Yankees as team captain for the rest of the season, but never played in a major league game again. Diagnosis As Gehrig's debilitation became steadily worse, his wife Eleanor called the famed Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Her call was transferred to Charles William Mayo who had been following Gehrig's career in his mysterious loss of strength. Mayo told Eleanor to bring Gehrig as soon as possible. Gehrig flew alone to Rochester from Chicago where the Yankees were playing at the time and arrived at the Mayo Clinic on June 13, 1939. After six days of extensive testing at the Mayo Clinic, doctors confirmed the diagnosis of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis on June 19, 1939 which was Gehrig's 36th birthday. The prognosis was grim, rapidly increasing paralysis, difficulty in swallowing and speaking and a life expectancy of less than three years. Although there would be no impairment of mental functions, Eleanor Gehrig was told that the cause of ALS was unknown but it was painless non-contagious and cruel. The motor function of the central nervous system is destroyed, but the mind remains fully aware to the end. Gehrig often wrote letters to Eleanor, and in one such note written shortly afterwards said in part, following Gehrig's visit to the Mayo Clinic he briefly rejoined the Yankees in Washington, D.C. As his train pulled into Union Station, he was greeted by a group of Boy Scouts happily waving and wishing him luck. Gehrig waved back but he leaned forward to his companion Rutherford Rudd Rennie of the New York Herald Tribune and said they're wishing me luck, and I'm dying. An article in the September 2010 issue of the Journal of Neuropathology suggested the possibility that some else-related illnesses diagnosed in Gehrig and other athletes may have been catalyzed by repeated concussions and other brain trauma. In 2012 Minnesota state legislators sought to unseal Gehrig's medical records which are held by the Mayo Clinic in an effort to determine a connection if any between his illness and the concussion-related trauma he received during his career prior to the advent of batting helmets and other protective equipment. The effort was abandoned after several leading medical experts explained that a records review would have no value unless correlated with autopsy data. An autopsy was not performed on Gehrig's body, and his remains were cremated after his open casket wake. Retirement The doctors of the Mayo Clinic had released its ALS diagnosis to the public on June 19, 1939. Two days later the New York Yankees announced Gehrig's retirement. There was an immediate public push to honor Gehrig. The idea of an Appreciation Day reportedly began with Bill Hirsch, a friend of sports columnist Bill Corum. Corum spoke of the idea in his column, and other sports writers picked up on the idea promoting it far and wide in the respective periodicals. Someone suggested the Appreciation Day be held during the All-Star Game but when Yankees President Ed Barrow got a hold of the idea, he quickly shot down the All-Star Game suggestion. He didn't want Gehrig to share the spotlight with any other All-Star. Believing the idea was valid and the best thing to do, he wanted the Appreciation Day to be soon and the Yankees proclaimed July 4, 1939. 
Lou Gehrig Appreciation Day at Yankee Stadium. Between games of the Independence Day doubleheader against the Washington Senators, the poignant ceremonies were held on the diamond. In its coverage the following day, the New York Times said it was perhaps as colorful and dramatic a pageant as ever was enacted on a baseball field as 61,808 fans thundered a hail and farewell. Dignitaries extolled the dying slugger and the members of the 1927 Yankees World Series team known as Murderers Row attended the ceremonies. New York Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia called Gehrig the greatest prototype of good sportsmanship and citizenship, and Postmaster General James Farley concluded his speech by predicting for generations to come, boys who play baseball will point with pride to your record. Yankees manager Joe McCarthy, struggling to control his emotions then spoke of Lou Gehrig with whom he had a close, almost father and son-like bond. After describing Gehrig as the finest example of a ball player, sportsman and citizen that baseball has ever known McCarthy could stand it no longer. Turning tearfully to Gehrig the manager said Lou, what else can I say except that it was a sad day in the life of everybody who knew you. When you came into my hotel room that day in Detroit and told me you were quitting as a ball player because you felt yourself a hindrance to the team. My God, man, you were never that. The Yankees retired Gehrig's uniform number four, making him the first player in Major League Baseball history to be accorded that honor. Gehrig was given many gifts, commemorative plaques and trophies. Some came from VIPs, others came from the stadium's groundskeepers and janitorial staff. Footage of the ceremonies shows Gehrig being handed various gifts and immediately setting them down on the ground because he no longer had the arm strength to hold them. The Yankees gave him a silver trophy with their signatures engraved on it. Inscribed on the front was a special poem written by the New York Times writer John Kirin. The inscription on the trophy presented to Gehrig from his Yankees teammates, We've been to the wars together. We took our foes as they came and always you were the leader, and ever you played the game. Idol of cheering millions records are yours by sheaves. Iron of frame they hailed you decked you with laurel leaves. But higher than that we hold you, we who have known you best. Knowing the way you came through every human test, let this be a silent token of lasting friendship's gleam and all that we've left unspoken. Your pals of the Yankees team. The trophy cost only about $5, but it became one of Gehrig's most prized possessions. It is currently on display at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. The Luckiest Man on the Face of the Earth On July 4, 1939 Gehrig delivered what has been called Baseball's Gettysburg Address to a sold-out crowd at Yankee Stadium. The following text is the official written version published on LockErig.com. The parts that are different from the available snippets of recordings of the speech actually given are shown in brackets in footnotes and replaced here by the words actually spoken. There is no known intact film of Gehrig's speech. Only a small snippet of the newsreel footage has survived incorporating his opening and closing remarks, for the past two weeks you've been reading about a bad break. Today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. When you look around, wouldn't you consider it a privilege to associate yourself with such fine-looking men as are standing in uniform in this ballpark today? That I might have been given a bad break but I've got an awful lot to live for. Thank you. The crowd stood and applauded for almost two minutes. Gehrig was visibly shaken as he stepped away from the microphone and wiped the tears away from his face with his handkerchief. Babe Ruth came over and hugged him as a band played, I love you truly and the crowd chanted we love you Lou. The New York Times account the following day called it one of the most touching scenes ever witnessed on a ball field.
That made even hard-boiled reporters swallow hard. Hall of Fame During a winter meeting of the Baseball Writers Association on December 7, 1939, Gehrig was elected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in a special election related to his illness. At age 36 he was the youngest player to be so honored to date. He never had a formal induction ceremony. On July 28, 2013 he and 11 other deceased players, including Rogers Hornsby, received a special tribute during the induction ceremony held during Hall of Fame induction weekend July 26, 29 in Cooperstown, New York. Final Years Following his retirement from baseball, Le Gehrig wrote, Don't think I am depressed or pessimistic about my condition at present. Struggling against his ever-worsening physical condition, he added, I intend to hold on as long as possible and then if the inevitable comes I will accept it philosophically and hope for the best. That's all we can do. In October 1939, he accepted Mayor Fiorello Lagardia's appointment to a 10-year term as a New York City parole commissioner and was sworn into office on January 2, 1940. The parole commission commended the ex-ball player for his firm belief in parole, properly administered stating that Gehrig indicated he accepted the parole post because it represented an opportunity for public service. He had rejected other job offers including lucrative speaking and guest appearance opportunities worth far more financially than the $5,700 a year commissionership. Gehrig visited New York City's correctional facilities, but insisted that the visits not be covered by news media. As always Gehrig quietly and efficiently performed his duties. He was often helped by his wife Eleanor, who would guide his hand when he had to sign official documents. Gehrig reached the point where his deteriorating physical condition made it impossible for him to continue in the job, and he quietly resigned from the position about a month before his death. Death On June 2, 1941 at 10.10 p.m., Gehrig died at his home at 5204 Delafield Avenue in the Riverdale neighborhood of the Bronx, New York. Upon hearing the news, Babe Ruth and his wife Claire went to the Gehrig house to console Eleanor. Mayor LaGuardia ordered flags in New York to be flown at half-staff, and major league ballparks around the nation did likewise. Following the funeral across the street from his house at Christ Episcopal Church of Riverdale, Gehrig's remains were cremated and interred on June 4 at Kensico Cemetery in Valhalla, New York, which is 21 miles north of Yankee Stadium in suburban Westchester County. Lou Gehrig and Ed Barrow are both interred in the same section of Kensico Cemetery which is next door to Gate of Heaven Cemetery where the graves of Babe Ruth and Billy Martin are both located in Section 25. The Gehrigs had no children. During their eight-year marriage, Eleanor never remarried and was quoted as saying, I had the best of it. I would not have traded two minutes of my life with that man for forty years. With another, she dedicated the remainder of her life to supporting Al's research. She died 43 years after Lou on March 6, 1984 and was interred with him in Kensico Cemetery. Monument The Yankees dedicated a monument to Gehrig in center field at Yankee Stadium on July 6, 1941. The shrine lauded him as a man, a gentleman, and a great ball player whose amazing record of 2,130 consecutive games should stand for all time. Gehrig's monument joined the one place there in 1932 to Miller Huggins which would eventually be followed by Babe Ruth's in 1949. Memorial Plaques Gehrig's birthplace in Manhattan at 1994 2nd Avenue near E103rd Street is memorialized 
with a plaque marking the site as is another early residence on E 94th Street near 2nd Avenue. As of December 26, 2011, the first mentioned plaque is not present due to ongoing construction. The second mentioned plaque is present but ascribes to his birthplace, not early residence. Gerrig died in a White House at 5204 Delafield Avenue in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. The house still stands today on the east side of the Henry Hudson Parkway and is likewise marked by a plaque. Film and other media Gerrig starred in the 1938 20th century Fox movie Rawhide playing himself in his only feature film appearance. In 2006 researchers presented a paper to the American Academy of Neurology reporting on an analysis of Rawhide and photographs of Lou Gehrig from the 1937-1939 period to ascertain when Gehrig began to show visible symptoms of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. They concluded that while atrophy of hand muscles could be detected in 1939 photographs of Gehrig, no such abnormality was visible at the time Rawhide was made in January 1938. Examination of Rawhide showed that Gehrig functioned normally in January 1938. The report concluded, The life of Lou Gehrig was the subject of the 1942 movie The Pride of the Yankees starring Gary Cooper as Gehrig and Teresa Wright as his wife Eleanor. It received 11 Academy Award nominations and won in one category film editing. Real Life Yankees Babe Ruth Bob Musil Mark Koenig and Bill Dickey played themselves, as did sportscaster Bill Stern. The 1978 TV movie A Love Affair, The Eleanor, and Lou Gehrig's story starred Bly Danner and Edward Herman as Eleanor and Lou Gehrig. It was based on the 1976 autobiography My Luke and I written by Eleanor Gehrig and Joseph Derzo. In an episode of the PBS series Gene Shepard's America the Chicago-born Shepard told of how he and his father would watch Chicago White Sox games from the right field up a deck at Comiskey Park in the 1930s. On one occasion the Sox were playing the Yankees and Shepard Sr. had been taunting Gehrig yelling at him all day, in the top of the ninth. With Sox icon Ted Lyons holding a slim lead Gehrig came up with a man on base, and the senior Shepard yelled in a voice that echoed around the ballpark hit one up here. Ya yeah, bum, I dare ya. Yeah. Gehrig did exactly that hitting a screaming liner, practically into the heckler's lap for the eventual game-winning home run. Shepard's father was booed mercilessly and he never again took Junior Gene to a game. He apparently told this story originally when Gehrig's widow was in the audience at a speaking engagement. Brought to you by Wikivd.com Would you like to know more?